Uh, with the country firmly in the grip of a second wave of the coronavirus, the South African Council of Churches is urging churches to do all that they can to preserve life, especially with Christmas just days away. To give us more on how churches will be protecting their congregations during this pandemic, we speak via Zoom to Bishop Malusi Mpulwana. He's the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. A very good morning and welcome to the agenda. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for having me on this Sunday morning. Uh, it is an exception. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm always unavailable on a Sunday morning, uh, 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 but this is an exception, obviously, because of the circumstances. Um, it is, it is grave. It is, it is. We say it is a state of war. The nation is facing a war. It's under attack, and that calls for a intensive commitment to prayer as well as commitment to the management of the regulations that prevent the death of people. Families are getting wiped out and people are not ever going to be able to get back to normality at all. We have to try and use this experience to make a difference. In the days of apartheid, we used to have what was called a Black Christmas. And that was a, a decision in the struggle to say we shall refrain from shopping for Christmas, and we shall not do the celebrations and festivities. That was all in the interest of the struggle. And we are saying now that we are inadvertently in a black Christmas. COVID Christmas is a black Christmas. Many people don't even know what to eat on Christmas Day because of the economic situation. Um, but many people have got empty chairs and in their tables because people have passed away, numbers of people in the same family. And it is a state that says we need to come together, hold hands uh, figuratively and support one another, but also accept that this time requires much more commitment. I must say to my friend, please cover your nose and your mouth with a mask. And the reason why the nose is important, and many people don't do this because they say it's suffocating them, it is because the virus is in the air, it's airborne, in the same way that in any house you will know somebody has been smoking because you will smell it. Unfortunately, the virus has no smell, but is in the air in the same way. And therefore, if, my, if your nose is exposed, it means you are inhaling the virus, and which is exactly what you're supposed to prevent with your mask. And we therefore have to make sure that we guard against each other. When I say to you, please, your mask, I'm doing it for not because I have a problem with you. It's because I suspect that I may be a carrier and I do not know it. And I need to protect you by making sure that you stay distant from me, that you are covered so that I don't, I like to say to people, I want to monopolize my COVID. Please let it stay with me. I don't want it to come to you. And, and that is the way we should love one another and care for one another. But we should also commit to praying for each other and supporting each other. And the churches must create prayer chains that say, so-and-so's uh, person is in hospital. Let's have a ring of 10, 12 people that pray with that person. Have a set time where the prayer is happening. We're doing this a lot right now with a number of different groups. And this is important to strengthen the people and bring hope, but also to pray for grace that people may survive. It is a terrible time. Uh, Bishop, uh, just a quick correction. Today is a Wednesday. I know that it's quite difficult to keep track of the days during the festive season, but also uh, during coronavirus times, just to keep track of the days <laughs> is quite a challenge. Uh, something else that's really come to the fore during this time, Bishop, is a lot of conspiracy theories. What is the role of the church in challenging these conspiracy theories that surround COVID-19 vaccines? <coughs> Sorry, I missed that question. Uh, what is the role of the church in uh, challenging the conspiracy theories surrounding COVID-19 vaccines? And there are a number of, a number of conspiracy theories around COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, and first of all, there's always been, in any case, there's always been anti-vaxxers, people that are against vaccines. Uh, there are also people that are skeptical of vaccines or people that are cautious uh, and they come from different directions. There are scientists that are against vaccines. There are also uh, religious people that are against vaccines for, for different various reasons. 
And that is just part, or it's just that it gets exacerbated at a time when we have social media, because then social media comes across as fact every time somebody opens. And did you hear this one, the latest? And then, of course, we pass it, we pass it on and we spread it. Uh, our view is that we need the scientists to actually address us appropriately about it so that all the cobwebs and anything that people have got at, at misunderstandings about can be cleared. One thing sure, though, is that there is no issue of conflict between science and the Christian faith. Because in our Christian tradition, we say that God created humanity in God's own image. And God's image is an image of creativity, an image where God creates things and the designs of, un of the universe are God's creativity. And we, as human beings, are given something of God's image of creativity and the ability to search the universe, to search the secrets of the universe of God's creation. And that includes our ability to understand medicine, to understand, that's what science is about. And so uh, we, 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 we then say that science is God's gift to humanity and it must be used in a holy and appropriate way. And when that is done and we are satisfied, then we should be able to prevent people's death uh, it's not a matter of saying, let people die if they will die, because I don't want science. No, certainly not. Bishop, what are you encouraging your members to do uh, over the Christmas services? Obviously, that's going to be taking place in just two days' time on Friday, but no more than 100 people are allowed in an indoor setting as set by the government restrictions. What are you encouraging your members to do and how to handle what is an incredibly important service for many Christians? It is very difficult because um, people need to understand that it is better to worship from a distance. Um, it is not easy because not everybody can do uh, these uh, virtual services. But the appeal is that hundreds is not the ultimate goal. The goal is that the number of people must be no more than half the square meterage of the venue. And so if we just say the number, then we're going to fill a place with 100 people when in fact you probably needed to only have 25 people because it was a 50 square meter space. And so uh, the focus is not so much on the numbers, but on the distance that has to be maintained. We're also suggesting that, um, that the, 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 the tradition of the evening service, or rather the night vigil of Christmas, uh, be brought forward uh, so that it is a shorter service, but earlier in the day rather than at, it's a midnight mess. After all, the, 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 the curfew does not allow for it. But also we're saying that it is important maybe to have to stagger services, have a number of services so that you can have smaller groups of people coming together beginning from Christmas Eve all the way up to uh, the day after Christmas. So you can sort of stagger your Christmas services over three days and, and enable people to enjoy the feast uh, the, of, 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 the, of, of, the, of Christmas, but do so in small numbers that can be managed. And maybe they can use an alphabet for that if they're members, or they can use uh, area, area by area. But as much as possible, it is better for people to register for participation. But I think that is one way of accommodating the numbers. How important is it to, it to revive one's spiritual life at such trying times like these that we've seen during 2020 and because of the restrictions and limitations that the coronavirus has placed on all of us? I think Christmas is particularly significant. It, it, or you can almost say Christmas could not have come at a better time for, for our needs because Christmas represents God becoming human to assume the human nature, to take upon God the pains and the joys of our being human. We have had so much pain this year that we actually need God to be part of that experience. And that's what Christmas actually represents. God, Emmanuel, God with us, God becoming part of us so that we, we, we are not alone. We experience the presence of God and the grace of God. It is important, therefore significant for our spirituality. This is the most important season of the Christian faith. And, and that is why we have to respect it. 
but we should also know that Christ, the very Christ whom we celebrate in, in, the, in birth, came in order to die so that others may live. And therefore, it calls for a certain measure of, um, of, of, of restraint in the way we celebrate it, in order that others may live. We should not celebrate it in a way that leads to other people to die. But it is also reminding us that we should bear one another's burdens and care for each other in a way that protects life. And that's why we're saying the regulations must be upheld in order to save life so that Christ who said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly can be truly celebrated in a manner that is protective of other people's lives. Speaking about uh, people needing care, uh, many bereaved families at the moment because of having lost a loved one because of the coronavirus. What is uh, the council's message to those bereaved families and also the importance that uh, the church plays in being a pillar of strength for those families going through mourning at this moment? Michelle, uh, <laughs> Uh, you're talking to me. <laughs> My brother passed away this morning from COVID. And that's probably why I'm not sure whether it's Monday, Wednesday, or Sunday. But um, the problem that we have is that when families lose a loved one from COVID, we do not have the drill. We, 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 we rush in and then more people get infected. And so the most painful part of it is the inability to give the appropriate loving attention to a bereaved family because they themselves become carriers, the people that have been living in the house with that person. It seems to me that one of the things we ought to try and make happen, maybe through the churches, is to ensure that whenever somebody passes away from COVID, the house is immediately fumigated so that people can at least be able to walk in there with a measure of, uh, of, of protection. But uh, it is an area that we have not prepared ourselves appropriately for. Uh, but we are want to say to people that are in my situation who have lost a loved one, that um, we may not be able to receive the guests and the friends and the, family, the distant family, but we need to know that God is with us. God will support us even when you're all by yourself. God is with you. Job says, I came alone into the world and alone shall I depart. When somebody departs such as they have now, those who remain, remain unable to reach out to many more people because of COVID. It is a very difficult time, but we must hang on to the faith that God is with us even in our loneliness with our dead. Oh, Bishop, uh, from myself, our team here at the Agenda and the SABC, our condolences on the loss of your brother. And thank you for the strength to still be able to take our interview and uh, speak to us. So we wish you and your family all the strength at this time. Also, what we saw this past Thank week uh, uh, over the past couple of days is uh, our Chief Justice um, and a prayer that he shared which elicited a lot of debate about the freedom of speech and the freedom of religious association. What's your take on that? We have always said that anybody praying, the prayer is never an issue. Uh, you know, there's a difference between the prayer and the speech. So when somebody makes a prayer, that's a prayer, you can't say uh, these are the boundaries of prayer. You might or might not like what a person is praying about, but that's, that's what prayer does, a person prays. So there can be no issue about uh, the, the, the right of anybody to pray as they wish. It's not even a matter of speech, it's a matter of faith. Um, now, therefore, the and secondly, as he explains, uh, that is praying against an evil. And I'll go back to what you said about, about um, conspiracy theories. There is a view, and I said to you that this can either be religious or scientific, that there is a, there is a, there is a strong uh, a, you know, a population of Christians that believe that um, uh, there is some a kind of purpose of the devil 
to 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 attack humanity, and that uh, these viruses are part of that plan. Now, that is not something that you you sort of wipe away by just counter argument. If it is what people believe, and it is a faith position for them, and and I think the reference uh, by the Chief Justice in his prayer against such viruses comes from a position that says there are viruses that are designed uh, for evil and that have to do with the devil, and uh, so you don't shout that down; you engage it from a faith perspective. What do you say to those people that are perhaps incensed by the prayer of the Chief Justice? Well, um, it depends uh, whether... Um, uh, I, I would still say that... I think they, 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 in the main, people have, people's complaint about the prayer of the Chief Justice has not been about the prayer so much about than about the fact that uh, it's a Christian prayer for... A chief justice of a secular state, and uh, and, um, and 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 I, I I don't say that uh, if you are chief justice of secular state you cannot pray, because uh, in fact our state is not a secular state constitutionally speaking. It simply says it recognizes all faiths. Now a secular state would recognize no faith at all, and so I think ours is not a secular state, but it is a multi faith state. It says all faiths are respected and that's why there's religious freedom uh, so i think it is it is not fair to describe it as a secular state that in that regard um, the point then is to say the chief justice should be praying uh, because of his position as a, as a head of the judiciary in the state that um, the concern must be that other faiths might be offended um, I, I, I think from the SSC's point of view, the only concern we have had, and, and I know that our leaders have shared, they have discussed this with the Chief Justice, uh, it is that we, we were concerned that while we respect the Chief Justice's rights to pray as he wishes, and as I've said before, nobody sends us prayer, but our concern was that if his prayer pronounces on a matter such as this one that is very controversial of, 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 of vaccines, um, while you do not want to stop the prayer because it has happened, it happens, there's always the possibility that uh, Malusi, that's me, might say, I want to take the government to court, to the constitutional court about uh, uh, the, the use of vaccines. Uh, and when that happens, it goes before the Chief Justice. And that's where someone might say, well, the Chief Justice is, 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 is pronounced on one thing or the other and biased one way or the other. And I think the Chief Justice is conscious of that, and I think he has engaged with our leaders, and, um, and we are satisfied that he has taken that into account. Uh, Bishop, can you share with us when uh, the South African Council of Churches did meet with the Chief Justice? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's confidential pastoral ministry. We don't discuss those things. I mean, the same way that uh, any time, uh, any, 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 any leader, uh, uh, we need to talk to them, whether it's the president or the chief justice or any other person. This just SSC does that all the time when there are issues to raise with leaders uh -huh. at various levels. We do that all the time. It's not something that uh, we, we, we publicize. Bishop, during this time of uncertainty that uh, the coronavirus has thrown the entire world into, people are searching for answers. And most of the time, leaders of churches are the first place that many people go to get answers to questions. But the coronavirus has placed those leaders under uh, a new kind of pressure because there is an uncertainty that pervades not only South Africa, but the entire world. What do you say to your members, the leaders of the churches, during this time where there is additional pressure perhaps placed on them? Maybe you should know that um, from the very first time that uh, this virus was announced, the, member, the leaders of the SSC churches met on the 19th of March, uh, right after it was first announced. And we then uh, decided on a pastoral plan. 
And that pastoral plan was confirmed the following week on the 24th of March. And from that day on, every Tuesday, the heads of churches have been meeting to review the situation and look at what next should be done. And that pastoral plan includes a communication platform. We have created a special uh, website, a COVID website. We call it churchinaction.org.za. Together with a WhatsApp platform uh, where one just WhatsApps why hi to a number that is 011-241-7800. 011-241-7800. Both those platforms are carrying COVID information, pastoral information, guidance, how to manage funerals and all those things for, 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 for pastors and families. And then we then, at the same time as we're doing that, and of course, for this, we've been assisted thanks to the Solidarity Fund because they assisted us to be able to create those platforms that are functional. But beyond that, we have then written a guidance, guidelines for our churches uh, through that the church heads of churches have authorized. And these guidelines have to do with everything to do with how do you yeah, that each parish congregation must have a COVID task team. They must see to this and this and that. How do you handle communion? How do you handle uh, uh, the collection plate? All these things that are potentially uh, infectious. These things, how you make sure that you don't have tea at, at, at church after church. That's why we want to make sure that even at Christmas, there will be no Christmas cake broken at church. <laughs> and that even the families that are coming together, it's advised that as much as possible they keep there because we are bringing people from different parts of the country maybe for Christmas. But know that the fact that they are your, your relatives does not make them COVID safe. Therefore, even a Christmas luncheon must be made to be COVID safe. So these are things that we are doing on an ongoing basis with heads of churches and their congregations. But we're not limited to ourselves. Everyone has access to these platforms. They, anyone can use them. That's why we're advertising them. So that if you have any need, uh, we now have to intensify our communication. For example, there's something that we never dealt with before. And that is, what do you do when a person... Uh, what, what are the first three things that you should do as a family when a person dies from COVID in your home? Um, uh, we're now having to write uh, you know, detailed instructions and guidelines on those things so that every member of the church uh, and, and the community can make it. Because in every society in this country, every ward is no less than 10 to 15 uh, uh, you know, places of worship, whether they are Christian or Muslim, but they will always be no less than 10 to 15 in every ward. And we're trying to make them bring these together in a way that says, let us together collectively be the source of guidance and support, as well as to see to crisis needs, like, for example, crisis relief, if people are destitute and hungry, this collective of local religious organizations must be able to minister effectively. And those groups that were that the South African Council of Churches has set up in collaboration with the Solidarity Fund, is that for all religious denominations? Uh, and does it advise oh, all yeah. religious no, 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 denominations no, no, no. on how to deal with the restrictions? I was talking about the communication platform for which we got support from the Solidarity Fund. The communication platform is for every South African. That's why it is a regular WhatsApp number it is why it is a, an, a, 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 a what's name a, a, a website that anyone can use. Now we are also always looking to see, for example, uh, what other faith traditions are doing, and try to bring as much of mutual learning as we can. Now the when we write the guidelines that we write, those guidelines are primarily intended for our congregations but we publicize them broadly so that anyone can use them. That's why we're able to, we also put them on the platform so that anyone can use them. We get calls all the time from people, churches and non-church non people that are not in, in, in the SACC that are looking for guidance when these things happen in their, in their families. We're quite open to do that. And this is why we, our, our communication platforms are for everyone. Remember that the SACC has always been a social justice organization, not for its own members. We didn't fight apartheid for our members. We did so for South Africans. We didn't fight corruption for our members. We did so for our church, for our, for, our, for South Africans. Everything we do is about the, the, the common good in society. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much, Bishop. Um, we thank you for being so generous w with your time during this difficult, uh, during this difficult time for you and your family. That is uh, the South African Council of Churches the General Secretary, Bishop Malusi Mbulwana, chatting to us here on the agenda. 
Thank you, ma'am.